Well, Ben Onora joins us now. He's a legal practitioner to look at uh, the security situation in the country. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Good morning, Simon. Well, uh, there's been some politics. Uh, we spoke earlier on with uh, uh, General Chris Olukwaladi and a couple of other individuals uh, uh, even last week talking about uh, some of these politics. Now we have seen a different uh, world dimension to it all. Yesterday we had Professor Charles de Kubo and I said, uh, well, the government were actually following his suggestion to say, well, if no one is ready to sell you arms, you can actually look towards another market. And he specifically was speaking about the well, refusal of uh, the United States to sell arms to Nigeria. Now we're looking towards uh, Russia and, of, again, the training given to the Nigerian army by the United States has also been terminated. In all of this, when we talk about fighting insurgency, as a Nigerian and close watcher situation, being a lawyer, what's your reading of situations? Well, thank you, Sloman. Um, to national politics, it is said that what you have is permanent interest, not permanent friends. When there's a consequence of friends fail you, they are not necessarily tied to their apron strings. They have a choice to look for new friends while making effort to mend that pressure that is now ruptured. It's been alleged that we have not been getting adequate cooperation from the U.S. on this fight. And what we have in our hands is a very severe matter, and we cannot therefore afford to fold our arms. It is therefore appropriate, and I think the red government has done right on this, to see for new friends. Because what we need is the cooperation of those who are truly and genuinely willing to assist Nigeria to fight this war. Mm -hmm. So if help comes from Russia, or from indeed any other country, so be it. We can always go back to the US and resolve our differences, if any. But, well, you said something about apron strings, but were we tied to the apron strings of the US? Did, was that the picture that you well, you know, you know that the relationship between the U.S. and Nigeria has been on for so many years. So one would expect ordinarily that um, that relationship should be such that it would take a very extraordinary thing for us not to get support of the U.S. But as it has happened, we seem not to be getting that support. And because a lot of African countries are indeed tied to the U.S. because of its superpower status. Russia is out of it now. Um, we, it's difficult to ignore the U.S. because of its power in the world and all the things it's doing. But if you consider the reasons that were given for their delayed assistance, so to speak, they had the concerns that the equipment that Nigeria is seeking to get from them will not be maintained. Besides being maintained, the other complaint was about human rights abuses. Now, Professor Dokobo said that shouldn't be a concern. Maybe the issue of management of the equipment should have been the concern. So, but let's look at those reasons that they gave. Are they not cogent enough to have slowed them down? Well, um, when you say equipment to another nation, I don't know why it is your business, how they maintain it. If there is an after sales agreement, Obviously, the U.S. has a role to play. The U.S. comes to play that role. If you just took this sale of equipment, it ends there. You have no business inquiring into how they use it or how they maintain it. This is a sovereign nation, for God's sake. They have no business today to us as to how those equipment should be used or how they should be maintained at all. Now, let's look at what happened yesterday. Uh, we, saw the attack on, uh, we saw the attack on Damaturo, and uh, we also saw the attack on Kano. There's been, you know, the talk of whether or not if the state of emergency had been extended, perhaps that would not have happened. Well, Kano has never been under the state of emergency. And, you know, the attacks on Kano have been sporadic, to say the least. But, you know, there's been the debate as to whether or not the state of emergency has been effective in the three northeastern states where it's been, you know, deployed to. What is your take on it? And uh, do you think that... For instance, some people argue that the troops were still deployed in spite of the fact that there was no state of emergency yesterday. Uh, w what is your take on the argument? Well, um, <clears throat> the, the right of the president to deploy troops as a commander-in-chief for defense staff 
what you have stuff, you have S stuff, you have device stuff, cannot be questioned. Under the Armed Forces Act, under the Constitution, this right is duly protected. But the essence of the emergency is to offer a cushion for our soldiers who are in combat operations. As you are aware, when you have a civil emergency, certain aspects of human rights are suspended. Because indeed, as you know, in the course of war, there could be mistakes. People could get mistakenly shot. People could go and conduct searches in homes without search warrants. If you do have a civil emergency, it means that those who do these things without that emergency could be vulnerable to litigation and to other uh, negative things. In any event, the Constitution, in recognition of the extraordinary nature of the emergency, has designed that when the nation is at war, when there is civil commotion, when there are natural or man-made disasters here and there, you need to have that buffer. Section 45 of the Constitution actually spells this out. So, is that emergency is not about the power of the president to deploy troops or to have people to go to war. It is about protecting those who are indeed fighting on our behalf so that no harm comes their way, a real litigation or attack from others in the course of their work. That is why that is there. And I ask anyway, if you are going, let me see, if you are going for hunting and you take a bag, because you, you, you assume that it's not likely you kill an animal that is long, that will be difficult to just carry. So you take it back, and you now go to this well, sorry, to this um, hunting expedition, you don't kill snakes. Would it make sense on your way back to carry the snakes in one hand and carry an empty bag in the other hand? No. This emergency was not put in there as a joke. It's a very serious matter. And this time it is required because the provisions or the requirements for granted are all present. You know, I, I, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. Sorry to bottom there. I, I'm sure the people of uh, these states understand the import or the importance of uh, having a state of emergency. Uh, I mean, look at what happened yesterday in Damatru. But again, don't they also have a right to say, please wait a minute, let's do some auditing, let's check and find out what we've been able to achieve all this while that we've had this emergency in our state. Uh, I mean, just a couple of uh, hours ago, uh, there's uh, been a 24-hour curfew in Dagmatur, so it also means that well, even the governors on their own can also effect some of these provisions in the Constitution to safeguard uh, lives and property in their community. There is no empirical proof to show that if you know this emergency or if you don't need it as it is the case now, the decision will get better. We must always try to find out what do the military want to do this work effectively. That is a critical thing. The Constitution provides for certain statutory bodies. The National Defense Council, the National Security Council, these bodies are populated by top brass of the military, the president, the vice president, and we should take it that they take up, give the president advice on a regular basis on what they need and what they don't need. So unless we have some other people who would carry out this fight for us, so it is the military, and that the ones leading. Even if you have what they call civilian JTF, we have local hunters, the principal people who are living in this world are the military. If they say they want this, I think it behoves on us to buy it for them. Because what do we lose really? If we give them the what do we lose as a nation? It's interesting that, you know, we listen to the governor of um, 
Adama State only recently, um, Balangilari, and he was saying that a state of emergency will, will be needed at this particular point in time. But then you also listen to some senators from the same area, and they argue that uh, their people are tired of the state of emergency, and they've taken that debate to the, to the National Assembly. Uh, how do you also see this politics playing out at the National Assembly? You remember that the House of uh, Representatives has adjourned till December the 3rd, and I think tomorrow they'll be all open. Uh, the Senate, they've not been able to make much of a headway in terms of this debate. But what do you see playing out at the National Assembly? Well, first of all, I actually expected the president to have done a lot of groundwork before asking for the renewal of this emergency. A lot of groundwork? Yes. Because what see, do you mean by that, sir? You see, the, we, we all know what was happening in the House of Rest particularly in terms of the Speaker's position and the political party that he belongs to and that he left and went to another one. So that was the vision. The President, in my view, should have done more by way of engaging the Legislative National Assembly. If he did, I do not know, but it's important. If that was done, then it has not manifested at all. In the US, they call it lobbying. If you want something done for you, you must take people you want to approach into confidence. So it doesn't matter if you are of the same party. It doesn't matter. This matter goes beyond party. Nigeria is at risk. In fact, some of those members of the National Assembly, if this situation continues, we don't have a constituency to be elected to. 